You're listening to the sermon podcast of North Valley Baptist Church. This week's message is preached by Pastor Scott McGrady. Well, if you would turn to Genesis, Genesis, and uh, we are going to be in chapters 40 and 41 uh, this morning. We're going to cover two chapters here uh, as we go through this. You know, we hate, uh, I should say I hate, (laughs) I hate feeling out of control. I'm assuming everyone here does too. (laughs) Yeah, I thought so. But we hate feeling when things are chaotic, or seemingly chaotic. But here's the truth of the matter. Uh, That feeling of control that we may search for, and and, and sometimes we may have moments where we feel in control. That feeling of control really is just a delusion. And sometimes it's really hard to, to get that into our heads and understand that. Uh, If you're like me, you find yourself very often fighting for that control and that feeling. But it is, if it's obtained, for whatever that short period of time that it's obtained for, it's really just an illusion. We are never actually in control. And really, though, that's good news. Uh, It would be devastating if we were the ones in control. Who is in control? God is in control. And really, there are times when God will allow things to be seemingly in chaos in our lives, from at least our perspective, and he will let us feel the weight of our lack of control in whatever our situation may be, in order to humble us, in order to bring us to that recognition that we are not in control, in order to bring us to depend on him who is in control, to trust in him. And who he is, and his character, and his sovereignty. He's in control even when things don't turn out the way we plan. He is in control of every little detail as we've been talking about the last few weeks. He's even in control of not just what happens, but when it happens. He's in control of his timing. And I think we see that this morning in our passage. He's so sovereign to fulfill what he has planned to do when he has planned to do it. He will do what he has said he will do. We can take that to the bank. He he always keeps his word. He is a God of promises. But he will do it in his timing, not ours. In her book, None Like Him, Jen Wilkins says this, The past holds for God no missed opportunity. The present holds for him no anxiety. The future holds for him no uncertainty. He was and is and is to come. Moreover, all of God's actions within time happen at just the right time. He is never early nor late, never subject to the tyranny of a deadline, never in a hurry, never playing catch up with a schedule that has careened out of control. But it doesn't feel that way from a human perspective. We look at the timing of events in our lives and think that perhaps, in at least a few instances, our timeless God has temporarily checked out. Have you ever felt that way? I think we have at times. But even though we may feel that way, like God has checked out, has he? Absolutely not. Again, he's bringing about all things in his timing. He is sovereign over everything. Now, as we jump into our text here for this morning, last week we began by seeing Joseph as a slave in Potiphar's house. Remember, the Lord was with Joseph even then. And he caused everything that Joseph did to succeed. Uh, Joseph found himself promoted to eventually being the manager over everything that Potiphar owned. And everything was under his control and under his care, except for the private matters of Potiphar. And and we see that included his wife as well. 
But the problem Joseph had is that Joseph was good-looking, right? And Potiphar's wife took notice. And so she propositions Joseph to lie with her, and, and she was persistent to not take Joseph's persistent no's as an answer. And so one day when he was working alone in the house, she caught him, and she caught him by his outer garment and tried to seduce him, but what does he do? He, he slips it off and he runs out of the house, leaving his garment in her hands, which then ended up being problematic because then that was her evidence, her proof, to lay accusation against him, being rejected by him, to accuse him, and to accuse him to the men of the house and blaming Potiphar for it. See, he brought this Hebrew to make fools of us. And she makes the same accusation to Potiphar as well. And so Joseph winds up in jail. But had God then at that point left Joseph? Was he then on his own? No, what do we read then? God was with Joseph. They're in the jail. God was with him. He was sovereign over everything. And there in prison, God caused, again, everything that Joseph did to succeed. And we see Joseph rise even in the prison. Now, uh, normally we would read through the whole passage and then discuss it after that. But, again, we're covering chapters 40 and 41, so it's pretty lengthy. So um, we're going to hit on the major portions and the important things that we want to make points out of as we go through. We're going to tell the whole story as we walk through this, Uh, but I do want to encourage you uh, to go back on your own and read through these chapters on your own and and see uh, what we are are all talking about as we go through this. But as we begin chapter 40, look there in verse 1. It says, some time after this, the cupbearer of the king of Egypt and his baker committed an offense against their lord, the king of Egypt. So it says here, some time after this, after what? After Joseph's there in prison, after he finds favor in the eyes of the warden, as everything he does succeeds, and the warden puts him in charge of everything there in the prison, that he is there caring for the other prisoners. After that, some time passes. However long it was, time passes. And time passes up to the point where An event takes place, whatever it may have been, where the cupbearer and the chief baker commit some kind of offense against Pharaoh. And what that offense was, I don't know. It could have been anything from them being involved in a plot against him to them just looking at him the wrong way when he had a bad day and he was just kind of angry and so threw them in jail. Any of those extremes and anything in between could have been what their offense was. And they wind up there in Pharaoh's prison. Now, the cupbearer, he was one who tested Pharaoh's drinks to make sure that there was no attempt to assassinate him. And therefore, the cupbearer had to be a loyal subject, wise, and, and someone uh, that was a good judge of character. With that, combined with his duties, putting him very often in the presence of Pharaoh... Usually the cupbearer was a trusted advisor to the Pharaoh, and he usually wielded political influence. The chief baker, on the other hand, it's not really sure how that position functioned. Uh, One commentator suggests that he functioned much like the cupbearer. His duties may have been virtually the same, except the emphasis being on the drinks of Pharaoh, they were on his food. And that very well may have been the case. And if it was, then he was just like the cupbearer, a high-ranking officer, one who wielded political influence. And that the both of them would have had to have been good judges of character, uh, that they would have had their staff and they would have had to keep from different ones who would have been against Pharaoh or, or wanting to uh, assassinate him or do anything like that. They would have had to have been good judges of character to keep such people out of their, their staff. And so we see, again, they they wind up there in prison with Joseph. And then the end of verse 4 says they continued for some time in custody. So again, more time has passed. Then one night, 
both the cupbearer and the baker have dreams. Now, this is the second time where we see a pair of dreams is crucial to the narrative and what's going on. And we're going to see it one more time before we finish today with Pharaoh's dreams. Now, the morning after they have these dreams, Joseph notices there's something wrong with them. And it's probably both the content of their dreams, the fact that both of them had these dreams on the same night, coupled with the fact that at that time, Egyptians believed dreams had great significance. Matter of fact, uh, they had professional dream interpreters with these commentaries that would talk about uh, the different symbolism that could be in dreams. Now, these things were very arbitrary, (laughs) uh, rooted in their pagan beliefs, uh, but nonetheless, that's what they, they did. Now, Joseph, though, would have known nothing of these traditions about dream interpretations, would have had no access to their commentaries. But one thing that Joseph did know is that God is sovereign. And if there was a reason to their dreams, if there was purpose behind them, then it was God that held that purpose. And so we read at the end of verse 8, Joseph says, Do not interpretations belong to God? Please tell them to me. So he wants to know their dreams. And so we read in verses 9 through 13. It says, So the chief cupbearer told his dream to Joseph and said to him, In my dream there was a vine before me, and on the vine there were three branches. As soon as it budded, it blossomed, shot forth, and the clusters ripened into grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. Then Joseph said to him, this is its interpretation. Three branches are three days. In three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your office, and you shall place Pharaoh's cup in his hand as formerly when you were his cupbearer. So that's, that's a pretty good interpretation, right? That's all right. A guy removed from his position, sitting in prison, that's that's the interpretation he wants to hear. And so the baker's there, and he's listening to this, and he's like, hey, I I like that. Hey, Joseph, what do you got for me? This is my dream. And so we read in verses 16 to 17, it says, When the chief baker saw that the interpretation was favorable, he said to Joseph, I also had a dream. There were three cake baskets on my head, and in the uppermost basket there were all sorts of baked food for Pharaoh. But the birds were eating it out of the basket on my head. And we see Joseph gives him the interpretation as well. Now, for for both the cupbearer and the baker, what these dreams were pointing to was going to find fulfillment in three days. So just like the three branches were three days for the cupbearer, the three baskets were three days for the baker. Three days in which the interpretation of the dream would be fulfilled. Now, both of them, too, would have their heads lifted up. The cupbearer would have his head lifted up, meaning that he would be shown favor, and he would be restored to his position. The baker, he would have his head lifted up, but there is a prepositional phrase there that's added to it when it says, from upon you. (laughs) And apparently that's literal. So he would literally have his head lifted off or lopped off. He, he, would, he was going to lose it. He, he was going to be executed. And then not only executed, his body was going to be hung on a tree, which probably refers to the practice of what they would do. Instead of giving the body an honorable burial, they would disgrace the body by impaling it on a stake and leaving it there for others to see. That way, people would see what happens when you cross Pharaoh. And it would be a warning, if you do this, this is what's going to happen to you. And it would be left there for the birds of prey to eat. That was the interpretation for the baker. Now, it turns out, three days from then, the day on which these dreams were to find their fulfillment, that was Pharaoh's birthday. Now, there is no evidence that the day of Pharaoh's physical birth was celebrated in this time period. There's evidence of that happening later on in history, but not at the time that Joseph's story would be taking place. 
But there is evidence that what was celebrated was not his physical birth, but what was considered Pharaoh's divine birth. In other words, when Pharaoh took the throne and so was considered to have become a god, and that anniversary was often celebrated by releasing prisoners from jail. And so for the cupbearer, his head in that time was going to be lifted. Again, he, he was going to be released. He was going to be shown favor. He was going to be restored, just as Joseph said. And the baker, well, Joseph's interpretation would come true for him as well. Now, with the cupbearer, though, Joseph saw great opportunity. He's saying, all right, this guy who had the ear of Pharaoh is going to be restored to Pharaoh's presence and again have his ear. And so we see in verse 14, Joseph asks the cupbearer to remember him and to mention him to Pharaoh. And he, he tells the cupbearer about all the injustice he has faced up to this point. But what happened when the dream is fulfilled and the cupbearer is restored? Verse 23 tells us that the cupbearer forgot Joseph. So that's not the opportunity that Joseph had thought it would be. And put yourself in Joseph's shoes. The cupbearer leaves. You know he's going back before Pharaoh. You ask him to remember you and to mention you to Pharaoh. And again, you tell all about your, the injustice you've faced so far, that you're not in prison for any good reason. And so you're anticipating that the time is coming when you're going to be released. He's going to tell Pharaoh. Pharaoh's going to say, okay, we've got to write this injustice, and we're going to send somebody to get you out. So you're there waiting anticipating, ready for this to take place. And you're waiting. And you're waiting. And then you hear footsteps. And you're there, so you get ready at the prison door, and you're all ready. You hear the, the warden's keys jingle, and you're like, yes, all right. And the warden goes right by. And days turn into weeks. Weeks turn into months. And eventually you get the clue. He hasn't said two words about you to Pharaoh. And no one's coming to get you out. And the disappointment that would sink in. How would you respond to that? How do you respond to disappointment? How do you respond when the plans that you have and your expectations don't work out? How did Joseph respond? Uh, I don't know. The text actually doesn't tell us. Don't know how Joseph responded. But I still think it's a valid question to ask not because the text tells us how Joseph responded, but because of what the text does show us. And what does the text show us? Well, it shows us what it's been showing us all along. It shows us that God is sovereign. It shows us that God is in control. And that God is sovereign over every detail, including the timing of things. You know, when we're people who want to be in control, when we're people who hate feeling like things are out of our grasp and can't pull things together, timing is a very important thing to us. You know, many people have pointed it out that we are and have been for the past however many generations, we are living in a McDonald world where we want it our way and we want it now. Well, have it your way, that's actually Burger King. So we're living in a Burger King world. We want it our way, and we want it now. And that's also very true for the 21st century church. When things don't turn out the way we want them to, when something doesn't suit us, we don't have our way, what is our attitude? How do we respond? I mean, look at Joseph's life so far. He got many things that he didn't want, that didn't suit him. And yet the whole time we've seen God is sovereign over all of it. When we face things, when we come across things that don't suit us, that, we, that are even tragedies for us, God is sovereign through it all. And God is sovereign through it all, even the timing of everything. Again, as Moses is writing this, it's demonstrating for Israel... God's sovereignty over them who just came out of Egypt, who just came out of 400 years of slavery. And 400 years of slavery clearly did not suit them. But God was sovereign. And God was sovereign even over the timing, over the 400 years until they came out of slavery. When our plans don't go as we had hoped, when we face disappointment, 
how do we respond? Do we respond in such a way that we do not show that we believe that God is sovereign and that God is doing something just because he hasn't done it yet or just because it hasn't gone the way we want it to doesn't mean he's not working and not sovereign. How do we respond? And, And listen, I know it's not easy. There are many areas that I, I, I've wrestled with and been wrestling with, of areas of discontentment. And I'm thinking, if things only went this way, if things only happened like this, and thinking about timing, well, this happened, but if this only happened when this happened, and I could see in my mind how that would work together, and I'd be, in my mind, better off. But again, can I trust God's timing is perfect? And can I trust that just because I think I'd be better off if this happened when this happened and came together, that I really don't know if I would be better off? Who knows? God. God is sovereign over what happens and when it happens. He's in control, and we need to trust that. When we're going through something and we're saying, God, can you just remove this obstacle? Can you remove this annoyance? Can you remove this difficulty? And we're praying and he doesn't seem to be doing so. Can we trust that he's doing his purposes, his work, even his work in us? Remember, go back to Romans 8, 28, right? That if we are saved, if we are trusting in Jesus Christ, if we know that we are sinners deserving of his wrath and hell, and yet we have, flown to the, we have run to the Savior, put our trust in Jesus Christ who died for us and rose again. If we are trusting in him alone for our salvation, that God has saved us, forgiven us of our sins, set us in Christ's righteousness before him. If we are saved, God is working all things for our good and his glory, all things to make us like Christ to glorify him. And so if he has not removed whatever it is yet, can we trust that he's still doing his work? Can I trust that he hasn't crushed the foolishness in me yet that he's using this thing for? Can I trust that he's sovereign? Now we have an illustration, I think, in in the book of Galatians. We see Paul has a thorn in the flesh. Now we don't know what the thorn is. People make their guesses and whatnot. But it doesn't really say And what does Paul do? He prays three times for God to take it away. And when he prays, what does the word say? No. What he does tell Paul is that through it, my grace is sufficient for you. But he doesn't answer Paul's prayer to take it away. Now, I believe he eventually did take it away, whatever it was. Whether it was in this life, or whether it's when God called him out of this world when Nero took his head off. In either way, God was sovereign and God's timing was perfect. Can we trust that? As Paul was trusting that. The opportunity that Joseph saw really was not the opportunity that Joseph thought it was, at least not yet. At least not right then. As we come to chapter 40, we see two years pass. Two years pass. And in the passing of those two years, while Joseph is still in prison, Pharaoh now has a set of dreams of his own. In his dreams, he's standing by the river Nile. And verses 2 through 4 tell us this. And behold, there came up out of the Nile seven cows, attractive and plump, and they fed in the reed grass. And behold, seven other cows, ugly and thin, came up out of the Nile after them and stood by the other cows on the bank of the Nile. And the ugly, thin cows ate up the seven attractive, plump cows. And Pharaoh awoke. And then we see in verse 5 that Pharaoh goes back to sleep and he dreams again. Verses 5 through 7 says, And he fell asleep and dreamed a second time. And behold, seven ears of grain, plump and good, were growing on one stalk. And behold, after them sprouted seven ears, thin and blighted by the east wind. And the thin ears swallowed up the seven plump full ears. And Pharaoh awoke, and behold, it was a dream. And these dreams troubled Pharaoh. So he called for his official priests, who were supposed to be skilled in dream interpretation. But none of them could give him a satisfying interpretation. Now this whole time, as I read this, I kind of picture the cupbearer. 
that as he's there in Pharaoh's presence and Pharaoh's trying to figure out these dreams and he's calling in the priests to interpret these dreams, that he's just standing there and being like, you know, there was something I was supposed to do. Something I just, ah, I can't remember. Ah. Now, now, maybe that's my own heresy that I impose in there. And maybe I'm just projecting myself where very often I'm like, there's something I was supposed to do. <laughs> Suzanne asked me that I came in here for a reason. Uh, but whether or not he did that, and however long it took as he's hearing about Pharaoh's dreams, and he's there in Pharaoh's presence, and he's seeing the priests come in to try and interpret these dreams, eventually we read this in verse 9. Then the chief cupbearer said to Pharaoh, I remember my offenses today. Oh yeah, there was something I was supposed to tell you. I remember now. You know, two years, better, better late than never, right? And the cupbearer recounted about when Pharaoh was mad at him and the baker and threw them in prison. And that in prison they both had these dreams. And each dream having its own interpretation. Then we read in verses 12 through 13, it says this. A young Hebrew was there with us, a servant of the captain of the guard. When we told him, he interpreted our dreams to us, giving an interpretation to each man according to his dream. And as he interpreted to us, so it came about. I was restored to my office, and the baker was hung. So he recounts what happened. He remembers Joseph, finally. And he tells them about how Joseph interpreted their dreams. Now, he might be trying to cover his neck as he describes Joseph as a young Hebrew, a servant of the captain of the guard. In other words, I mean, he wasn't that important that I should remember him. He was just a servant. He was a, he was a Hebrew, even. So, yeah, that's why, you know, that's why I forgot. But what does Pharaoh do? He calls for Joseph. And Joseph was brought to Pharaoh after they got him cleaned up. Dirty in a dungeon, that, that wouldn't be very welcoming to bring him before Pharaoh. And they shaved him, and they put him in Egyptian dress, because, well, he, it's not going to be very welcoming to bring him looking like a Hebrew either before Pharaoh. And so they bring him in, and Pharaoh explains that he has heard that he interprets dreams. And Joseph, rightly so, is quick to correct him. And we read in verse 16, Joseph answered Pharaoh, it is not in me, God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. And by, Pharaoh, and by favorable, uh, he means an interpretation that Pharaoh will be satisfied with. And he says this, and it's true, obviously, Joseph's saying, it's not me, it's God. He's pointing to God. God's the one who's going to give interpretation. One, lest Joseph takes credit where credit is not due. And also, two, Joseph giving God the glory, this sets Joseph up later to urge Pharaoh to take heed of the interpretations. Listen, this is from God. So then Pharaoh recounts his dreams. In verse 25, it says, Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, The dreams of Pharaoh are one. So he had two dreams, but, but in a sense they're one because they're, they're one message. The dreams of Pharaoh are one. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. In other words, God gave you these dreams. And God is going to give you the interpretation. So you better listen up. And Joseph told him that the fat cows... And the seven plump grains represented seven years of plenty. Seven years of great crops. And the thin, ugly cows and the dried up grains, they represented seven years of famine. In verse 28, Joseph said, It is as I told Pharaoh, God has shown to Pharaoh what he is about to do. So seven years of plenty followed by seven years of famine. And that seven years of famine was going to be so bad that it was going to make the seven years of plenty forgettable. It was just going to eat up all the plenty. In verse 32 it says, And the doubling of Pharaoh's dreams means that the thing is fixed by God, and God will shortly bring it about. So it's fixed. There's nothing Pharaoh can do to change these dreams and what's going to take place. God has determined he's going to do this. And again, notice too, who's going to do it? Who has fixed it? Who's going to bring it about? God. 
God will surely bring it about. And again, in verse 28, he said that God has shown what he is about to do. God's going to bring about the seven years of plenty, and God's going to bring about the seven years of famine, of horrible, extreme famine. What can that mean? Is God really the one who's responsible for such things? Is God really the one responsible for plenty and famine? Famine? Famine, sorry. I mean, think in our own lives. When something goes well and, and we feel good and something happens that's, that we see is for us and in our favor as we want things to be, we often say what? Thank God. Hey, thank God that happened. But do we say thank God when things don't go the way we want them to? When we feel pain and, and, and fear and, and all of those other things? Do we give God the credit for the plenty just as we give, do we give God the credit for the famine just as we give him credit for the plenty? Is God really going to bring about a famine? Would God do such a thing? Would God do such a thing by bringing about a pandemic? Would God do such a thing? Ultimately? Yes. Yes. God is in control of all things. Nothing happens outside of his sovereign decree. And why? You know, I've talked to many people who are optimistic people. And they've talked, as I've talked to them over the last few weeks and months, they, they've talked about the good things that have come out of the shutdown and all of these things. Good, good things have come out of this. And I agree, good things have come out of this. Good things have come out of this because there's a good God who is bringing about his good purposes in everything. And even in these things that they've mentioned, they say, oh, good things have happened. And we can recognize, yeah, God is bringing about good things. But even in that, ultimately, what is he doing? We don't know. Don't know what his ultimate purpose is in all of this. There are some who say, well, God's, God's bringing about judgment. Others have pointed to the virus as a sign of the end times. Uh, that one I think we can throw out. <laughs> Uh, it does not meet the catastrophic level of signs of the end times uh, for it to be such a thing. But God does have a purpose and does have a reason, and all that transpires. You know, we see this throughout Scripture. Yeah, both in the plenty and in the famine. God brings them both about. Now, we read in Job chapter 2, verse 10. It says, Shall we receive good from God? And shall we not receive evil? Evil there is the Hebrew word that can be translated as darkness or chaos and can refer to that which brings about calamity or harm, pain, destruction. We also read God say through his prophet Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 45, verse 7. God said, I form light and create darkness. I make well being and create calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things. God does all these things. God is sovereign over everything. That's what we see in Scripture. That's the God that the Bible reveals to us. God was working out His will in the seven years of plenty that would be followed then by seven years of extreme famine. And just as He is working and was working in the hatred of Joseph's brothers, just as he was working in them, throwing him in a cistern and selling them as a slave and, and being sold as a slave into Potiphar's house. And, and he was working in the unfulfilled lusts of Potiphar's wife that got him in prison. Just as he was working in the anger of Pharaoh towards the cupbearer and the baker to bring them into Joseph's life and to use them to bring Joseph to where God was bringing Joseph for his purposes, to be there at that time before Pharaoh. In God's timing. He was doing all of those things. Getting Joseph right there to urge Pharaoh of what he had to do as God has revealed what God was about to do. And so Joseph urged Pharaoh to get a discerning and wise man and set him over all the land of Egypt. And then Pharaoh tells him that he needs to appoint these managers who would collect a 20% tax on the crops during those years of plenty so that it can be taken and stored up for the years of famine. 
And so Pharaoh decides that he's going to do just what Pharaoh says, or just what Joseph says. And in verse 38, it says, And Pharaoh said to his servant, Can we find a man like this in whom is the Spirit of God? Is there anyone else we can look to and find anywhere? No? No, I think I got the man. That's what Pharaoh's thinking. I think the man's already right here in front of me. When we read in verses 39 to 40, it says, Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has shown you all this, there is none so discerning and wise as you are. You shall be over my house, and all my people shall order themselves as you command. Only as regards to the throne will I be greater than you. And right there, in everything that has transpired, Joseph became the most powerful man in all of Egypt, second only to Pharaoh. Think of everything Joseph has gone through. <laughs> Uh, would you have ever seen, if we didn't know the story, if this is the first time we're hearing it, and we see Joseph getting beat up by his brothers and thrown into a cistern, did we ever think it would lead here? No. Absolutely not. And the king gave Joseph his signet ring so that Joseph could sign documents and sign things into law. He clothed him with the clothes and jewelry of his office. And then Pharaoh gives Joseph a new name, and he gives him a wife, the wife of the daughter of Potiphar, a priest of On. And commentators point out, saying that changing his name and giving him this woman as, uh, as a wife would solidify him in his office before the people. At this point, Joseph goes from the hatred of his brothers to a slave of Potiphar to the most powerful man, again, second only to Pharaoh in all the land. And all of this happens... In 13 years. Remember, Joseph was 17 when he was sold as a slave. And we read here in verse 46, at this point he's 30. And in verse 49, it tells us that during the seven years of plenty, Joseph stored up grain in great abundance, like the sand of the sea, until he ceased to measure it, for it could not be measured. And during that seven years of plenty, Joseph has two sons. Verse 51 says, Joseph calls the name of his firstborn Manasseh. Not an Egyptian name, a Hebrew name. Manasseh. Why? He says, for, he said, God has made me forget all my hardship and all my father's house. God has made me forget everything I've gone through, everything that hurt. And forget here isn't the sense that he can't recall it, that it's out of his mind. But it's in the sense that he was not going to dwell on it and let the bitterness fester in him. Joseph was not stuck on the grudges of the past, but he could see God working through it all and focusing on God's kindness through everything, even in the pain, as God was working to bring him to that point. He could be full of gratitude instead of being full of bitterness. Uh, I think we can learn from Joseph here. Very much so. Instead of dwelling on the things of the past, be grateful for all that God has been doing through it all in our lives for his purposes, even using pain, even using sins of others and our own sin, as we've discussed. And be grateful that God has been so kind to us, bringing about the growth and giving us opportunities and working his purposes in our lives, something we do not deserve. And yet God has done such a thing and is doing such a thing. And I wonder how much freer you and I would be to forgive others, to not dwell on past grudges, when we can have such a grateful heart. Instead of dwelling on the injustices that we have faced, dwell on the work of God that he has done for us in our lives, for his glory. He was able, by God's grace, to forget. And we see this. We see this as we come to and see how he named his second son, in verse 52. The name of the second son he called Ephraim. He says, For God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. God has been so kind in each situation, working his purposes for his glory. And in the seven years of plenty, when they were over, Joseph divided out and sold the food for everyone in Egypt. And not just Egypt. The famine was so bad that it reached into the world. And the world was coming to Joseph for food. And we're going to see in the next chapter how God used that. 
God was completely in control of everything Joseph went through, putting Joseph in the right place at the right time. And I'm convinced that just as God was directing Moses to write and record this historical narrative so that Israel would know their God as they were coming out of Egypt themselves, so that they could trust and obey him, trust and obey him through everything they were going to face, God in his sovereignty, I am convinced, has also preserved this for us so that we can know him, so that we can trust and obey him in everything. And all that happens to know that he is sovereign over what happens and when it happens for his honor and his glory. Do you know him? Can you trust him as sovereign and good in everything, in every detail, including the working out and the timing of everything? Are you in control? Am I in control? No. Praise God, he is in control. Let's pray. Thank you for listening to the sermon podcast of North Valley Baptist Church. For the complete sermon archive and more information about the church, please go to visitnbbc.com.